Okay, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Henny Agnoni, who has just recently joined the uh, robotics faculty. Um, <laughs> Thanks, guys. Very sweet. And she's uh, doing outstanding work in nonverbal communication and human robot interaction. She has done her PhD at Yale University working with Brian Skasolaki on uh, nonverbal behavior for social assistive robotics. Before she joined here as a postdoc in 2016, the Persian Robotics Lab. And just a few months ago, she started her own lab here, the Human and Robot Partner Lab. Thing. And uh, I will now hand over to Hattie, who will tell us more about her vision about robots that collaborate and assist humans. Beautiful. Thank you. We can applaud Katarina. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming. I'm very, very excited to talk to you today about the kind of work that I do in uh, socially and physically assistive human robot interaction. Um, so Katarina gave actually a really great introduction, but it, you know, just in case she didn't, I put up a couple of slides about my background. So I started my long career trajectory that some of you guys are on right now. Um, at Wesleyan University, which is a small liberal arts college in Connecticut. The wonderful thing about Wesleyan, one of the many wonderful things, is that they were really into exploring and interdisciplinarity, so they let me design my own major. So my undergraduate major was completely made up, and it was a, <laughs> and it was a combination of computer science and cognitive science. Basically everything that I needed to, to be able to model people, or so I thought. Um, I stayed on for a fifth year master's degree to finish up some research, and then I made my way over to Yale uh, to do a PhD with Brian Scassolotti, who everyone calls Scaz. Um, even his wife calls him Scaz. And, uh, and as Katarina said, I did my PhD in nonverbal communication and how robots can recognize nonverbal behaviors from people, and also how the robots can generate nonverbal behaviors to make interactions better with people. Um, after that, uh, I came here to CMU to do a postdoc for a year and a half with Sid Trinavasa uh, in the personal robotics lab. Uh, and now uh, I am faculty here, which is very, very exciting. So I, I only go to school in places that are beautiful, apparently. <laughs> um, and so uh, as new faculty, I get to start a new lab, and I've started the Human and Robot Partners Lab, HARP. Uh, and the idea of the HARP lab, the goal, is to uh, develop robots that are autonomous and intelligent and that help people either through social or physical interactions. So this is the HARP lab space. It's shared with Katarina's assistive manipulation lab upstairs in Noel Simon um, and you guys should come by. So it's a really good time to be looking at robotics that is helping people through physical and social interactions because we're seeing this massive transition right now, this turning point from robots in factories or robots that are isolated to robots that are designed to operate in uh, human environments. So this is um, a snippet of robots from this year's Consumer Electronics Show, which is a big um, consumer, obviously, um, uh, showcase. And what we see is this huge number of robots all of a sudden that are actually being marketed to go into people's houses or into people's offices and help them do everyday tasks. We also see wonderful videos like this that come out. So here is a manipulation robot that is designed to help you cook. It is a professional chef robot, um, and the dynamics of it are beautiful, and they motion captured professional chefs and figured out how they cook and replicated it in a robot. And this robot is pretty incredible, but it's still operating behind a pane of glass. Right? Even though it is cooking for people, it's still cooking in a completely separate environment. It's in your home, but it could really be anywhere else. It's not really in your home. The kind of robotics that I'm looking at is drawing robots beyond this kind of uh, interaction that's separated into truly collaborative, truly co-located interactions. And I want to do it uh, in domains where robots are assisting people, either through uh, social interactions, as I said, or through physical ones. So here are some examples of what I mean by social and physical assistance. Socially assistive robots are robots like tutors or therapy assistants or coaches or motivators. These are robots that 
communicate with people through natural language, through nonverbal behavior. They worry about maintaining engagement. They worry about conveying information and teaching people and keeping people uh, focused and not distracted. We also have physically assistive robots. These are robots that take advantage of the fact that they are physically located in the environment with people, that they can manipulate the environment and move it around. And they help people, for example, with motor impairments to perform everyday tasks, like picking up a glass of water and taking a drink. The goal of my lab in uh, all of the assistive robot interactions that we develop is to have robots that assist people in all of these complex tasks, in learning math or uh, in, in physically uh, manipulating their, their environment. And the way that you do that, the way that you get robots to actually help people is by leveraging the natural behaviors that people are already producing. Robots need to know how to help people and when to help people. And the wonderful thing is that people are constantly projecting how and when they need help through things like their eye gaze or their body posture or their uh, verbal and, and uh, prosodic expressions. And so my research goal is to capture those behaviors from people to make robots into assistants that are actually useful. So I'm going to talk to you a lot about nonverbal behavior today. And just to make sure that you're all totally sold on how important nonverbal behavior is, I want to give you an example of what nonverbal behavior can give us. So I'm going to show you uh, a video. First thing I'm going to do is play the audio from this interaction. This is an interaction with two humans. Um, the woman facing the camera is the one who's going to be speaking the most. She's a teacher, and she's teaching her student how to play this board game. Uh, so I'll play you 30 seconds of the voice clip. And I want you to figure out, listen to the audio and figure out if you were a robot who was just getting a speech transcript, would you be able to understand this interaction? I'm fine with being like the green too. Yeah, is it works. Okay. 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 <laughs> so basically like um, these two things, um, they kind of keep track of our progress across the entire game. Okay. All right, so some of that you can probably understand, like, are you fine with being the green player? And some of that was a little bit hard to understand without context cues, like these two things, right? What two things could, could she be referring to? So now I'll show you the video itself with the nonverbal behaviors, and let's see if you get more information out of it. Are you fine with being, like, the green player? Yeah, because yeah, it works. works. Okay. I like I yellow. Yellow. Okay. <laughs> so basically, like, um, these two things, um, they kind of keep track of your progress across the entire game. Okay. So there are two insights that I want you to take from this exercise. The first is that nonverbal behaviors are used for dixis. They're used for referring to objects in the environment without having to explicitly specify them. Right? So these two things are the two uh, game tokens that uh, keep track of your score. The other thing that nonverbal behavior gives us is information we didn't even know we were missing. So at the end of the video, she says, they keep track of your progress across the entire game. And as she does that, she's gesturing towards the score uh, marker line. Right? So even though the text, they keep track of your progress, doesn't tell us that this is where the score gets increased, through her nonverbal behaviors, we can get additional information that isn't even being spoken. And that's the real power of nonverbal behaviors. Not only that we can define, that we can uh, understand deictic references, but that we can get completely uh, additional information that isn't even being conveyed verbally. So I hope you all agree. Um, when people are interacting with robots, understanding their nonverbal behavior is really important. And it can reveal the kinds of things that people are thinking about or what they're going to do next. Now, the field of human-robot interaction, which is the area that I work in, is really this amalgam of a lot of different disciplinary areas. We have robotics, of course, and we have robots that have to operate in the real world, which means we need all of the robotics that, that happens to make robots function in the real world. We need the motion planning, and we need the vision, and we need the dynamics to make them actually function, and we need the AI and planning to uh, figure out the decision making for the robots. And so all of that is really important. But in a human-robot interaction, there are also humans. And so not only do we need all the robotics, we also need all of the psychology about people, or at least the psychology that's relevant to our task. We need to understand how people uh, come up with and represent intentions internally, how they direct their attention in a scene, how they make decisions about what they're going to do, and how they communicate that information verbally and non-verbally. 
So HRI is really a combination of these two. That wasn't me, I don't think. I don't know. Um, and, and so the, the field that I'm in, HRI, really takes a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and because I studied cognitive science as an undergraduate, this has really shaped the way I do human-robot interaction. I take a really uh, cognitive approach to determining, to designing robot systems, and then to evaluating them. One of the key elements of nonverbal communication in human-human in, in human interaction is eye gaze. So eye gaze is one of the capabilities that's developed extremely early in life. It may be innate, depending on who you ask. Um, but babies very, very quickly learn to recognize eyes. They very quickly learn to follow eye gaze. Um, and it's actually a critical component of learning about your environment. Eye gaze has a lot of functions, even for adults, uh, when we're interacting. So gaze has been shown to be able to uh, identify who's part of a conversation and who's just a bystander that's listening in. Gaze is used to regulate conversations, to take turns naturally and seamlessly, which is why it's so hard to talk on the phone sometimes, especially in a conference call, because you don't have the nonverbal cues that are helping you regulate turn-taking. It also helps regulate the topic of conversation. Um, eye gaze can be used to disambiguate spoken references. So just like in the video before when she said these two things, um, our teacher didn't have to work very hard to develop words for these objects because she could just point to them and say these. And people can use that information to disambiguate references. And eye gaze can help also help us predict what people are about to do. So psychologists know that when people manipulate objects with their hands, they reach to an object uh, they, sorry, their eyes move to that object before their hand even starts reaching toward it. Right? So that piece of information is sort of like a future prediction. We can read people's minds and figure out what they're about to do next just by where their eyes are going. So I'm telling you all of this. I might have taught you something new just now, but HRI researchers have known this for a long time. And they've shown that robots can do the same thing. Robots can be used to include or exclude people from conversations. They can be used to regulate the conversational turn-taking or to create conversations that are more or less intimate based on where they're looking. So people will actually wait for a robot that's looking up as though it's thinking more than they will wait for a robot that's just silent without looking up. Eye gaze is used to disambiguate objects when there are multiple objects that are similar. People can use a robot's eye gaze, even if that robot is very, very simple. Um, in order to predict what the robot is going to refer to. And eye gazes can be used in handovers and other kinds of actions to help coordinate human action. People can read what a robot is going to do based on its gaze and then create a more seamless interaction. So if you guys have gotten really excited about eye gaze in HRI from that, you can do some additional reading. Uh, this is a review that I just published this year uh, that talks all about how important eye gaze is in HRI and the way that it's used. I'll let you guys write that down. So, one of the key functions of eye gaze in HRI is that, or eye gaze at all in any human interaction, is that it directs people's attention. People look in the direction that other people are looking. And this is a psychological fact. Um, psychologists have determined this through very clever, very well controlled studies. Um, and they found that there is what they call a reflexive cueing effect. That when people see a partner with their eyes averted, when they see a gaze shift, within the first two to 600 milliseconds, so within the first half a second, their attention shifts in that direction. And they can't help it. They do it even if you tell them to ignore the gaze direction of their partner. This is a reflexive effect. It happens very, very quickly. And then after that, they can exert cognitive control. That's what should be on. Okay, so I've told you that there's this reflexive effect in human eye gaze. I've told you that robots are capable of using eye gaze to extract all sorts of effects from human interactions. Surely, robots can exhibit this kind of reflexive cueing effect, right? Wrong. Um, robots fail to elicit the reflexive cueing effect. People can exert conscious control and ignore the direction of robot eye gaze um, in order to uh, achieve their, a different kind of task. And this suggests that there's something different happening in the low-level processing, in the cognitive processing between robot eyes and human eyes. Well, that's confusing, right? Because I'm telling you, on the one hand, that robots can't re 
like the robot eye gaze is different from human eye gaze, but on the other hand, I'm telling you that robots can use their eye gaze in all sorts of social interactions. So, you know, what gives? What's going on? What if it's not just that robot eye gaze exists or does not exist as a cue? One research hypothesis is that eye gaze needs to be intentional. That people need to ascribe some sort of meaning to the robot's behavior before they're willing to see that robot's behavior as meaningful. So, uh, for example, until uh, it is agentic, until it is autonomous, a robot is more like a toaster. And once the robot does something smart, something intentional, uh, the robot becomes this agentic being, and now we're ascribing all sorts of capabilities to it, including meaningful eye gaze communication. All right, cool, so uh, okay, so how do you make a robot intentional, right? That's the next obvious question. What does it take? That is a research question. But let me show you one way that we've managed to make robots intentional and use their eye gaze. So this is a study I did um, here at CMU in the personal robotics lab, looking at eye gaze during handovers. And the handovers are really critical for human robot interaction, especially physical collaboration. A lot of collaboration ends up being robots handing objects to people or people handing objects to robot. And all the prior work on handovers focused on optimizing the smoothness of the handover, making it as seamless as possible, so that the human and robot had no hiccups in the way that uh, robots uh, handed objects to people. What we wanted to ask was, during this handover behavior, can you also convey gaze information? Can you use eye gaze to communicate another modality, like as another modality to communicate additional information to people? Because that would open up a lot of another channel for, for giving information. And so we designed a study um, with this robot called Herb. Herb has two arms, and, and what Herb did in the study was he handed blocks to people and once Herb handed a block to someone, he would look at one of these two objects, one of these two bins, the blue bin or the yellow bin, as a suggestion of where people should put the block that Herb just gave them. So this is what it looked like. This is participant eye view, so you guys are participants. Herb reaches under the table, grasps the block. We, we did a little joint attention, so Herb looks up at you, then looks down at the block, and then reaches the block over. There's a six-axis force torque sensor in the wrist that can perceive when someone has grasped the block uh, they, they pick it up, and as soon as they pick it up, Herb opens his hands and releases it. The head turns to one of the two boxes, one of the two bins in front, uh, and then turns back. And we were manipulating these gaze behaviors, and we were trying to figure out what kind of gaze was most effective for communicating this information, and it didn't matter at all, because people completely ignored the robot eye gaze in this task, which makes sense. Their task is to retrieve an object and place it in a bin. And psychologists have shown that people very rarely gaze at entities or spaces that are not involved directly in their task. So they were focused on the robot's hand when it was doing the handover, and then they had the block, and then they were focused on the bin that they were moving the block to, and they never even looked at the robot's head. By happy accident, which is the way a startling amount of science actually happens, um, we had a situation where on one trial, the robot handed a block, but didn't let go for one second. So we had uh, essentially a blocking call, so the robot handed over the block, held onto the block, turned his head towards the bin, and only then let go of the block. And when we ran that, all of a sudden, people were looking back at the robot's head for an explanation of what was going wrong. Um, and we were seeing that, that in, in the situation where the robot didn't let go of the block for one second, that's the only difference, this one second of handover delay, all of a sudden, the robot was being seen uh, the robot's eye gaze was being seen as much more meaningful. So we ran a study around that. The way we designed the study is we were trying to reduce the, um, the potential complexities of eye gaze communication to a binary choice. Do people follow the robot's suggestion that's conveyed through gaze or do they not? The robot handed people uh, blocks over the course of five trials. And the blocks could be one of four different kinds. There were, there were blocks that were solid colored. Um, there were blocks that were half and half, 50-50 yellow and blue. And there were blocks that were 75% one color and 25% another color. For the blocks that were solid color, Herb always handed those over and then suggested the bin that, the, that was the color of the block. This was our control. People tended to sort the blocks into the same color bins anyway. Um, so that's what Herb suggested. For blocks, 
Um, these are our two experimental conditions. In the ambiguous case for the 50-50 block, Herb would hand over the block with one color on top. And then he would suggest the bin of the color that was on the bottom. So this set up kind of a little bit of tension, right? Because people typically sorted the block by the color on top. By suggesting the color on bottom, there is some question that we're raising in people's minds, but it's not a really hard choice. The block could conceivably, because it's half and half, be sorted either way. Uh, for the semi-ambiguous case, this was our, our hardest interaction. Um, Herb handed over the block with the majority color on top and then suggested the minority color as the bin to sort. So looked at the other bin. So here, Herb handed this block over in this orientation and looked at the yellow bin. And the goal here was to set up this counterintuitive choice where people tended to sort it one way and Herb was suggesting something else. And we wanted to see how often people would comply with the robot. And that score, the compliance score, gives us some insight into how effective the robot's gaze communication was. So the way the, robot, the way the study ran, this is kind of a, a repeat of the video you saw, but essentially the robot looked at the, at the user, at the target, um, the, and handed over the block. The force torque sensor perceived the grasp from the user, and the robot would open his hand uh, and release the block and then turn to look at one of the two boxes in front of it. So that was in the delay condition, uh, in the no delay condition, the control condition. Half the participants saw that. Half of the participants were in the experimental condition, where the robot waited one second during this head turn to release the block. And just this one second difference created a huge effect in the way people treated the robot. So I'll show you three videos. The first three videos are of the no delay condition. There was no wait between when the robot handed over the block and when it released it. And in general, people didn't look at the robot's head at all. As I said, they're very focused on the task. They do kind of whatever they want. And they're rather bored. <laughs> Doesn't care. On the other hand, when the robot had a delay, it created completely different interactions. We'll make it look like blue, he says. So he's acknowledging that that's not where he would have sorted it. And this was actually a really challenging decision for people. <laughs> this is our manipulation check. It's clearly a counterintuitive decision. numbers, we get the same thing out of this that we get out of these videos, which is people spent more time looking at Herb's head when in the delay condition than in the no delay condition. After the fact, more people reported that they saw Herb's gaze suggestion in the delay condition than in the no delay condition, even though at the beginning of the experiment we told all of them Herb would make a gaze suggestion. Afterwards, uh, significantly more people in the delay condition remembered it. And then when we look at the compliance score, we see the same thing that in the delay condition, people complied significantly more often with the robot than in the delay condition. So what this study showed us is that people will follow a robot's eye gaze, but only if they have a reason to. That we can actually use the robot's other nonverbal modalities to create these emergent social effects that cause people to pay attention to a robot's eye gaze. So going back to the original insights that I started this talk with, just to remind you, it's that nonverbal behavior gives us information that robots can use to be more assistive, and that HRI requires us to pull from cognitive science and from robotics when we design robots to work with people. In the process of doing the research that I do, I touch on a couple of fundamental HRI questions. This first one is familiar because I just talked about it. What does it take to make a robot seem intentional or agentic or capable? When you have a robot that's a partner, you want it to be an intentional agent. What, can, what makes a robot seem that way? 
what kind of behaviors do robots use to communicate their internal states? We have all of these sophisticated models for robot behavior. How does a robot project what it's going to do to people so that the interaction is easy and smooth? And on the flip side, how do robots read the kinds of projection people are doing to understand what people want, want or are going to do next or what kind of help they need in assistive interactions? And if you think about it, these three questions kind of form this nice cycle where we start by uh, having a robot Nope. Okay. There we go. Cycle. Um, we start by having the robot become an agent, seem like a, a trustworthy partner. We continue, we can build on that by having the robot actually use nonverbal communication to communicate its own internal states. And then uh, it can also recognize human mental states, to under so recognize human nonverbal communication to figure out what's going on inside people's heads. And once we know what's going on inside people's heads, we can use that how they use their behavior to express uh, intentionality to build even more intentional or capable robots. So I told you about this first uh, aspect. I'll move right on to the second one, which is about getting robots to communicate their internal states. So let's say you have a robot, like this now, that's helping you build an IKEA chair. And the robot wants you to pick up a particular object. It always has speech. In my research for now, I'm assuming that we have speech. Speech is known. The robot says the large wood frame. The question in this research is what other nonverbal behaviors, what nonverbal behaviors should the robot produce that support that kind of verbal expression? Should it use any? Should it use all of them? And the naive uh, approach would just be to use all of your nonverbal behaviors. Why not? The robot can look at something. It can point to something. Maybe it can turn its shoulders. Like, just use them all. The problem with that is that nonverbal behaviors are not free. They have costs both to the robot and to the person and to the interaction itself. So robot costs include just the, the power of running the motor, which might actually matter for a robot that's operating on battery, or the computational cost of planning a trajectory for pointing. There's the cost to the human, because the person has to parse this information that the robot is giving them nonverbally, and that increases the cognitive load. And also, when robots are pointing with their hands, they can't be doing other things with their hands. Right? So you're, you're capturing that modality for communication when you might want to be able to use it for some other function. So my goal was to uh, develop a model that allowed robots to decide when to use nonverbal behavior and when not to during uh, this kind of instructive interaction. And I started from these known elements that we know uh, the kinds of behaviors the robot can produce. In this case, the robot can look at an object, or it can point to an object, or it can do both at the same time. And we also know some s cost ranking, some ordered list of costs, where the cost of looking at an object is not as high as the cost of pointing to the object, which is not as high as the cost of doing both at the same time. Um, the insight in this work is that we can pick what nonverbal behavior the robot should do by modeling human attention, by figuring out what nonverbal behavior it takes for people to understand the robot. And so what we do is we calculate for each object in the scene and for each behavior the robot can do, we calculate a score called a likelihood score. We say, what's the likelihood given this nonverbal behavior that the robot will think this is the target object? and we calculate out the likelihood scores for all of the objects in the scene, we figure out if our target object likelihood score is high enough. And then we select that, uh, the behavior that makes that target object likelihood score, score high enough. So how do we define this, this function, right? This, this weighted feature vector, how do we even assign those scores? And to do that, I need to take a little foray back into cognitive science to talk a little bit about visual attention and how people process visual scenes. So in cognitive science, we have this understanding uh, of visual saliency. It's that the visual system works um, it's sort of in, in the sequence where some features are processed very, very quickly and ver are very easily recognizable. So uh, some of you may have seen a test like this, but I'll give you another interactive thing. This is a test. I'm going to show you a field of letters. I want you to raise your hand when you see the one letter that's not like all the other letters. All right, ready? Go. Right, okay, so the red T pops out, right? Let's do another one. Ready, go. 
All right, so pretty hard, but everyone was still really, really fast there. <laughs> you guys are great. You guys are all paying attention. All right, last one. Cool. Okay, so we had like we had like kind of smattering and things, things happen in, in sequence, right? So that if if you can't see it, it's right there. It's that F. Um, this is a visual saliency effect that the visual system is tuned to recognize some features more rapidly than others, and it can recognize things like color and shape very very quickly. Psychologists actually understand this really well. Unlike most of the brain, um, the visual system is something that we really do understand so much so that we can make software about it. And people publish these kinds of uh, code bases for doing things like saliency detection, where you can put in an image and they'll spit out a map, a heat map of the saliency of the scene. And from this we can extract how salient the different components of the scene are from a human perspective. Okay, so back to the model I was designing. I want to understand how people are going to direct their attention in the scene, and saliency is part of that, this low-level saliency. So that's an element of this feature vector. It's the S. The other elements are uh, the high-level components of the task, so the words the robot is saying, which dictate what task the person is doing, and then the nonverbal behaviors the robot can do, the eye gaze and the gesture it can perform. So I'll just give you a quick overview of how we calculated these things. As I said, the visual saliency came out of a saliency detector from CVPR that's neurologically based. We looked at the words just simply as a bag of words, so we calculated the proportion of words that, uh, that the robot was saying um, and how many of those were actually used to describe the object. Um, and the gaze and pointing score were calculated essentially like uh, by shooting out a, a cone of rays uh, from centered on the robot's head. So the gaze score, the cone of rays emerged from the robot's head with the center ray normal to the robot's uh, direction of gaze, or in the direction of gaze. And then we uh, figured out which objects that cone covered. And we had an attenuation function, A, that attenuated the score of the rays that were further out on the edge. And that sort of simulates how gaze becomes less precise as you go further out. So objects that were in that cone also had a gaze score. And it was the same thing for pointing. Objects that were in the cone that was created by a, um, the ray coming out of the robot's finger uh, also got a pointing score with a tighter attenuation function, which represents that pointing is a more precise modality for dixis than eye gaze. So from all of those, um, we calculated out this likelihood differential. So basically, for every object in the scene, for every nonverbal behavior, we calculated out a score. So here are the scores for these objects in this particular scene with that nonverbal behavior. And then we figured out, for our target object, which in this case is the large wood frame, is the score for the object sufficiently high, sufficiently different from all of the other scores? Um, and we tried to select the behavior, B, such that we minimize the cost of the behavior, so we chose the lowest ranked costing behavior that still kept that likelihood differential above a certain threshold, which was an experimental parameter that we tuned. Okay, so basically we're modeling human attention, we're trying to figure out what nonverbal behaviors does the robot need to produce in order to direct human attention most effectively to the target object without producing extra nonverbal behaviors. And then we evaluated this model. So it's great to build models, but of course we have to evaluate them in studies with people. Um, and we did it in a, an interaction like this, where a robot was giving a construction instructions. It was telling people how to build an object. So you can think of this as a kind of assistive robot that's uh, instructing or tutoring you on how to perform a physical task. Our hypothesis is that the behaviors generated by the model, so the way the robot behaved under the model, um, would mediate the effect of task difficulty. So it would make harder tasks easier if the nonverbal behaviors were used than if they were not. And we measure success easier by measuring how accurate people were at putting together this construction that the robot told them about, and also by timing them and seeing how efficiently they did the task. So here's what it looked like, again, from the participants' view of being in this study. So the robot would give you a set of instructions. Put one of the small red blocks on top of the large line block. Put the small green block next to the red block. Then stack a small blue block on the red block. Put the arrangement in the middle of your right. 
Okay, so this isn't Disney, so the robots are not like incredibly uh, realistic, but the robot is generating these nonverbal behaviors based on the saliency from the user's perspective and the words that it's saying and the model that I just described. To vary the difficulty of the task, we manipulated two different factors. The first is how much people had to memorize of the task itself. So you just heard a series of instructions, put this block on that block and put it, on, put it underneath this block. Um, in the easy task, people had to memorize six steps of instructions. In the hard task, they had to memorize eight. Uh, in psychology, we have this idea of seven plus minus two being this kind of sweet spot. Seven is generally the maximum uh, chunks of information that people can remember plus minus two. So we're really straddling that line here. And actually adding two extra steps really did make the task significantly harder. In addition to uh, altering how much information people had to remember, we also uh, added an additional manipulation for making the task even harder. And this might be my favorite manipulation that I ever did in any study in my PhD, which is people came in and uh, they listened to the robot give these instructions. And then we told them that you have to wait until the robot's done giving the instruction before you can start building the construction. So they listened patiently to the robot, and then as soon as the robot finished, they were about to start building the block structure when I burst back into the room with an iPad and I said, I'm so sorry, I forgot to give you this before. You have to fill out this test right now. And they said, no, but I'm about to build the thing. And I said, no, 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 do it afterwards. You have to do this right now. <laughs> and what was on the iPad was a mental rotation test. So if you guys are familiar with these, um, this is an example question from it. You look at the object on the left, you have to identify which of the four objects on the right represents a rotation of that original object on the left. And uh, in case you're sitting here figuring it out, it's this one. This was the easiest question of the eight that they had to do. They had four minutes to complete this task. Um, and then they were allowed to return back to their, task, their, their original task. And the idea was that if they were creating any sort of uh, visual cognitive representation of the construction that they were supposed to build from the robot, that that was being wiped by the, the need to do this visual mental rotation. Um, OK, so to summarize, we had uh, we altered, we manipulated the memory load, whether people had to remember a short instructions or long instructions. We manipulated whether an interruption happened. And we manipulated whether people saw the robot producing nonverbal behaviors or not. So this is a two by two by two study, which meant there were eight conditions. We were between subjects, which meant people were assigned randomly to one of those eight conditions. And what we saw Remember, I had two factors that, we were, that I was going to measure at the end of this. One was performance in terms of accuracy, and one was the time. When we look at performance in terms of recall accuracy, um, here we have the uh, number, the proportion of correct steps as a function of memorization load. We can see that when the memorization load is low, people actually do this task quite well. And even though these two lines, one is on top of the other, these are actually statistically indistinguishable. They're performing it you know, 90% or better, which is basically as, as well as you can expect anyone to perform on this task. But when the mem memorization load increased, when, when it was harder for people, their behavior diverged, depending on whether or not they saw nonverbal behaviors from the robot. So seeing nonverbal behaviors mitigated this difficulty. If they saw nonverbal behaviors, which is the red line, they didn't do as badly, even if their memorization load was high. Whereas if they didn't, their, their uh, accuracy dropped quite steeply. When we look at time, we see a similar trend. So this is just in the high memorization load condition. Uh, and this is the no interruption case and the interruption case. So these are the hardest two trials in the entire t uh, study. What we see is that when there was no interruption, even though the memorization load was high, people performed at about uh, the same, took about the same amount of time to finish this task. And like, 24 seconds is about how long it takes you to put eight blocks together in a certain pattern. But when there was an interruption, when people had this additional cognitive uh, load to, to bear with, the, having seen the nonverbal behaviors helped them remember or helped them complete the task faster. Here we're using completion time as a proxy for confidence. If they're confident, they're going to do the task quickly. And if they're not, if they're having trouble remembering, then they're going to slow down. So we can see they slowed down significantly more when there was an interruption if they did not see nonverbal behaviors from the robot. In other words, robots are mitigating 
how hard a task is by using nonverbal behaviors. And the nonverbal behaviors, again, are selected based on our model for what people will need from the robot to understand the robot's reference. So that was all about communicating the robot internal states. This is an example of how you can capture human cognition uh, in your model for developing robot behaviors. Um, and then there's the flip side, of course, right, which is recognizing human states from human behaviors. And so this is work that I've done uh, in a specifically assistive domain where we look at eye gaze and how eye gaze from people can reveal the kinds of uh, help that people need and the kinds of actions they're going to perform. So I need to make a brief foray into talking about assistive robotics, in this case, physically assistive robotics. So there are robots on the market. This is a commercial platform, uh, this robot called uh, Kinova Miko. It's sold by a company out of Canada. There are about 150 people in the world who actually use this robot on their powered wheelchair. And it hooks into the same power system as the wheelchair, and they control it through whatever input device their wheelchair is used. They use to control their powered wheelchair. So in some cases, this is a joystick. In other cases, this is a sip and puff, which is a straw that sits by your mouth, and you blow out and, or you suck in, and that is your control signal. Um, or they can use a head array, which is uh, kind of a headrest with buttons in it that you can use to press with your buttons. So clearly, these are very limited input sources. And in fact, if you think about it, we have a clear issue here. We have a dimensionality problem. Because the robot control is a six degree of freedom problem. If you think about end effector control, you have X, Y, and Z in Cartesian space, and then you have pitch yaw roll, so the orientation of the end effector. Six degrees of freedom you have to control simultaneously. Whereas these input devices give you mm, maybe two, I put three here, three is really optimistic, maybe three degrees of freedom at a time. So one way that people address this is by using a system uh, called modal control, where you divide the control space into different modes. You control two degrees of freedom in one mode, and then you explicitly swap, and then you control another two degrees of freedom, and so on. And modal control is, is good. It at least helps people use the robot, but it's really hard. It's hard to remember what mode you're in. It's hard to accomplish the task. So this is a study that was done here by Laura Herlant. Um, and uh, what she found is that people spend about 15% of their time just switching modes while they're doing this task. So admittedly, this is a novice. Uh, this is not a disabled user. And so it's not exactly our target population, but you can see even, even with practice, people have a hard time doing tasks like this. The insight is that we can have the robot collaborate with the person. While the person is controlling the robot through their input device, instead of having that control just purely teleoperate the robot, we can add an intelligent system in the middle that tries to predict what the user is accomplishing and then take action to help assist them toward that end. The challenge with shared autonomy is that while the user might know what object they want or what task they're trying to accomplish, in this case, a task is picking up the hat, the brooch, the pterodactyl, um, the robot knows, the human knows what they want, the robot has no idea. And so the robot has to model all of the user's possible intentions and figure out which one the user is trying to follow. So uh, Shervin and Sid and Drew Bagnell here at CMU created this really lovely system for shared autonomy that represents the user as a POMDP, where the uh, user's intentions are latent states in the system that lets us to, uh, demonstrate or, or model the uncertainty about which intention the user has, and then the joystick control becomes the observations that update the belief over the latent states. And I'm not going to go too deeply into that model, but it works pretty well. So on the left here, you see a robot being controlled in an eating task purely through teleoperation. On the right, you see the robot being controlled through shared autonomy. And you can see the robot is assisting the user on the right, which happens to be me, in uh, picking up bites of food so that I can complete the task much more quickly under shared autonomy than under teleoperation. Um, and even with practice, this still seems to be, uh, this is still probably the case, that shared autonomy just speeds up the interaction significantly. So shared autonomy works well, but it depends on this kind of joystick control, these joystick inputs. And we're leaving a lot of information on the table from the human behaviors that people are, all, are already exhibiting. 
So my thought was, why not also take advantage of eye gaze that people are exhibiting? We know that people are looking at objects that are relevant to their task. They're not looking at objects that are not relevant to their task. And they're even looking at objects before they go to manipulate them, at least if they were to do it with their hands. And so we stuck eye, gazes, uh, eye trackers on people, and we had them do a shared autonomy eating task. And what we found is really interesting. It's that not only does eye gaze seem to reveal uh, what the user's intentions are, but they also, eye gaze is also able to tell us when people are having trouble. Um, so this is, these are data we're still analyzing, but here's an example. So this is the same eating task. Um, the big video is from the eye tracker perspective. So this is egocentric perspective. The pink dot represents where the user is looking while performing this task. And what you can see is that for the most part, they are looking at the end effector that they're teleoperating. And sometimes the user monitors down at the plate to figure out where he's going. But in a second, he's going to make a mistake of control, which is that the robot's elbow is going to drop too low. It's not his fault. He's doing end effector control. The robot IK drops this elbow down. And now he's in trouble because he can't spear the piece of food, and he knows it. And you can see that he knows it because his eye gaze pattern completely changes. He mostly stops looking at the plate, and now he's monitoring the robot elbow and trying to get the robot back out of that situation. And when we map this out, you can see this visually. This is a timeline where the different colored blocks show different kinds of gaze, uh, different uh, uh, positions of gaze. When everything is fine, the user is looking mostly at the end effector and the plate. When there's a problem, the user is looking at other parts of the robot that are not involved in the task. The system doesn't know that he's failed yet. There might still be a legal kinematic you know, configuration that takes him from that place to, or to, the, to the goal of spearing the food. But the user doesn't think he can get there. And his eye gaze reveals that problem. Here's another eye gaze video that shows a different kind of assistance that a user might need from a robot. Um, so this is actually an expert user of the system. This is a person who's had the robot on their wheelchair for five years. Um, and we asked uh, this user to pick up the handle of the telephone. The task is actually to pick up the handle of the telephone and dial 911. It's a task that comes out of an old um, uh, physical occupational therapy test set for people who have suffered strokes. Um, and what we see is that it takes him a really long time because the robot arm itself is blocking his view of the end effector and of the handle. So now he has to use the robot in end effector control, move it back out of the way, trying to like intuit the IK of the robot you know, as, it, as it kind of sorts itself out, and then, and then move the robot arm back in. And this is really challenging. He's an expert. It takes him three and a half minutes to pick up the handle on the telephone. It's not his fault, right? The robot is in his way. Um, there's no reason that robots can't get out of the way, right? We can use people's eye gaze to recognize when a robot is obstructing their visibility of a target object. And then the robot can automatically reorient itself so that the user's task is easier. We're not even controlling the, main, the primary task here. The robot is just kind of reorienting its kinematic configuration. So this is ongoing work that I'm doing in how do we go from shared autonomy that is either based on uh, direct input like a joystick or like a BCI to shared autonomy that's based on indirect input, like people's eye gaze or the words that they're saying or other biometric signals that they give us. In this work, I haven't talked at all about socially assistive robotics, uh, not explicitly, so I want to make one more mention of that. This is work that, I'm, uh, that I did a little bit in my PhD and I'm hoping to start up again uh, here at CMU. How do we get robots to become good coaches or good tutors or good therapy assistants? Um, how do they respond to the behaviors that people are exhibiting to recognize when someone doesn't understand or when they're frustrated or when they're distracted and then take action to accommodate that? And the real goal here is to develop robots that are augmenting and supporting the kind of work that teachers and therapists are doing every day. There's evidence in education that shows that students benefit from one-on-one -on -one learning. But Teachers don't have enough time in their day to give students significant amounts of one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Wouldn't it be cool if a robot could take part of that load and could become a practice partner? Robots also provide us this really interesting uh, middle ground for things that people couldn't possibly do. So for example, peer learning is really important. Um, there are studies that show that when people teach their peers, they learn in a different way, they encode information better. But adults obviously cannot be peers to children. 
And sometimes you want to achieve something in peer learning and you can't, you can't necessarily put two kids together and trust that peer learning will happen successfully. A robot is a really interesting middle ground because it can be a peer. We don't have these preconceived notions about robots. What if we used robots as peer tutors for children practicing skills? Um, so that's the, uh, this is the kind of socially assistive side. It still requires monitoring human behavior, especially nonverbal behavior, to figure out what kind of assistance people need and then providing that assistance in a timely way. So in this talk, uh, I talked to you about sort of three major areas of my research. One was about how nonverbal behaviors can make robots seem intentional and how sometimes using nonverbal behaviors depends on robots seeming intentional. I talked about a model that I had developed that models human attention uh, from cognitive psycho psychology principles in order to predict what kinds of nonverbal behaviors people will need the robot to communicate to them. And I talked about a uh, physically assistive application where reading human eye gaze behavior can give us additional information about what kind of help people need. None of this work, of course, is possible without the many, many collaborators. Um, so these are collaborators who have worked on material that I presented in this, paper, uh, in this talk. Um, and uh, there are many more who've influenced me, obviously. Uh, we all stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, and I want to leave you with just this high level thought which is that to help people, we need to understand what kind of help people need. And to understand what kind of help people need, we need to understand the psychology of how people express their internal states from uh, nonverbal and verbal behaviors. And so what I do is I blend this psychology insight with autonomous robotics to develop robots that are more effective assistance for people. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, time for questions. Yeah. So, uh, is there any work seeing how you, people have to understand that robots have uh, attention and are agentic to, you know, to interact with properly? I have a flip question, though. So, like in self driving cars, people have seen that users trust the system a little too much sometimes. Mm -hmm. like too much mm -hmm. How can you use your research to design systems that communicate their actual level of communication? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that is a, that is a core research question in HRI right now, which is how do you um, mediate expectations of a robot? How does a robot sufficiently communicate what it's capable of and what it's not? Because we ha fall into these situations where people expect too much of a robot. In a self-driving car situation, that can lead to calamity. In a socially assistive situation, that can lead to just frustration with the system and abandonment of the technology. But it's true. It's the same principle, I think, of figuring out um, what people's mental model is of the robot, and then how robot behaviors can adapt that mental model. It's also the reason that uh, some of the commercial robots, a lot of them don't use speech. So Curie, for example, is a home robot that's meant to come out this year to be commercially available, and it rolls around on the ground, and it can listen to voice commands and respond to voice commands by doing stuff, but it doesn't talk back to you. And that actually not using speech actually brings the, the expected capability down to a level where people are not going to be disappointed when this you know, really fluent robot then can't understand certain sentences. So there are key decisions that people make in that realm, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so in my, in my last uh, HRI class, I did a project. It's basically produce, um, create a robot uh, for elderly people. Mm. And I interviewed the uh, 12 elderly people in person. And they tell me that they have, I kind of uh, sort their needs to two categories. First one is they, they want to have some cognitive interaction with the robots, like the robot just the chatbot or can understand your mm -hmm. emotionally mm -hmm. needs. And uh, the second category is they can, they, they hope the robot can do some mm -hmm. physical work, mm -hmm. like pick up the, pick up the mm -hmm. trash and just uh, upload something on the shelves. Mm -hmm. So how do you think about these two kinds of needs? And sure. Yeah. So the question, for those of you who didn't hear it, is um, in, an interview, in interviews with elderly participants, um, they recognized, they identified two kind of classes of assistance they wanted. One was a physical assistance of the robot picking things up off the floor. The other was uh, this kind of social uh, com like companionship assistance of robots engaging them. 
And this falls actually kind of nicely into the socially assistive, physically assistive division that I described. There's the physically assistive side where robots have to manipulate objects, navigate in the environment, things like that. There's the socially assistive side where robots have to recognize uh, human emotion, produce conversation, um, understand what, what kind of social interaction people want. Um, so I think it fits very well. We rarely see that together in one system. Um, and I think that's because both of these are really open research questions. It's really hard to get a robot that is both physically manipulating the world and is able to uh, you know, be a, a social companion. More often we see a social companion like Paro, the seal robot that's furry, or we see a robot that's a physical assistant like Herb that's in intended to manipulate. We don't currently have a really physical assistant robot. Not commercially. Yeah. Yeah, manipulation is hard. <laughs> yeah, not commercially, uh, to my knowledge. Although, you know, things like the Canova arm are a step toward that. That is a manipulator that, that is a commercial product, but it's not autonomous as a commercial product. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, just kind of touch a bit about it. It's like, so we talked about in the very beginning that we need non-verbal behaviors and stuff like that. But we also know that we could compensate for it. Let's say that your vision impaired, you can, like, instead of saying, uh, see this, you can say, oh, right, a blue cube. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I was to me, you had thought about like, when should we use those instead of like the gestures, like thought about like the cost function there. You didn't really mention like, all right, maybe instead of pointing, maybe we should just yeah. say a very long sentence. Like yeah. That. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, so the question here is for visually impaired users, how do you reconcile nonverbal communication? How do you balance that with the cost of, of other kinds of communication. Um, I think that even for uh, people who are vision impaired, obviously pointing is not going to work, um, but there are nonverbal behaviors that you can produce that will help them, like uh, guiding with the hand, right? So that's a kind of haptic uh, visual, uh, haptic nonverbal communication. Um, so yeah, you, you will probably have to rely on language more. Um, I'm not an expert in, in sort of visual impairment, so I don't know it seems to me that, that people who are visually impaired often rely on language more in their day-to-day -day life than people who are not, uh, like spoken language. I'm not sure if that's true. Um, but yeah, you have to, the cost function changes, right? Yeah. Just a quick follow-up. Mm. So I guess in a more general sense, like let's say you say there's a cost of battery because of point. Mm -hmm. So maybe instead of saying that you're funny, you just have a very long sentence. Yeah. So I think you've about that a bit more. I see. So there is a cost to language too. Um, very long sentences also exert cognitive load. People understand them less. There's more potential for confusion. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of natural language on picking the sentences that are short enough but still meaningful. I think we can incorporate that into the same kind of model, where instead of pointing, the robot uses other nonverbal communication, and maybe we also have a cost function on the length of the sentence, and we try to balance speaking at all or speaking a long sentence with using other kinds of, like, guiding behaviors. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? If not, let's thank Henny for this really okay. entertaining talk. <laughs> Thanks.